I'm ASAP Preach. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. I was born on April 15th, 1988. I'm the only child my mom ever had, actually. So at the age of one and a half, my mom and my biological father, David Barnett, um, they got a divorce. I um, never really remember him very much as a, as a baby, obviously, but he left me and my mom. I'd rarely see him as a child, actually. My mom never really talked bad about him, which I thought was pretty cool. But at two years old, this, this, this man stood up in my life and he took me right up under his wing. And as far as I can remember, actually, he was my dad. We were like best friends. Uh, 1990 when I first met Ian's mom, uh, she was playing hard to get. I asked her out, she kept saying no. Uh, she didn't want to do it, she, was, she had things to do. And it was funny because I was persistent. And then finally she gave in and we went out and we went out a few times and she wouldn't let me see Ian yet. So uh, when she finally let me see Ian, he was, he was a stud. I knew right then, that little uh, mullet haircut that he had, uh, he was going to be a stud one day and uh, we hit it off. Uh, me and uh, Ian's mom, I mean, we started dating, uh, then we moved in with each other, and I mean, basically I was raising Ian as my own. We did everything together. I mean, we fished together, we drove together, we went to sporting events together, we did everything together. I even took into my sister's track meets from when she was in high school. I mean, we were inseparable, period. I mean, it was just, it was two peas in a pod, man. We were just, we were great together. I mean, I didn't have to have any friends, I had Ian, that was, I spent all my time with him. He was a great, great kid, uh, no wrongs. I mean, he was good in school, he was athletic. I mean, we, we play fought, I taught him how to fight. Uh, me being ex-military, I mean, I taught him some cool stuff. I mean, we'd go to the creeks, we were, I taught him snaking. I mean, basically every time that I wasn't at work, I was spent with Ian. When Ian was probably two, I took him snaking for the first time. Snaking is when we go down the creeks and we look for stuff. Uh, mainly snakes and uh, somewhere there's a picture where he's just hanging on to my belt loose basically with floaties on his arms in, in the water while his mom was uh, taking pictures of us. I said he was an amazing child growing up. So my childhood was actually pretty good from my perspective. Um, I was taken very good care of by my mom and my stepdad and we had some really good times actually. You know, the house that I ra was raised in was, you know, all the bills were always paid. You know, I was grateful for that. But, you know, I can remember a lot of crazy things that happened there in the house too. Back in the day, when me and Angela first started dating, we were party animals and we were young. We were young and dumb uh, and we did some crazy stuff. We did drugs, we drank, we drank a lot. We drank pretty much every day. Uh, we had parties. We partied every week, and I would have 30, 40, 50 people at my at our house, and with Ian there. And you know, back in the day, I mean, you really didn't think too much about it. I mean, it, I knew Ian wasn't going to get hurt because I was there. Nobody was going to touch him. And if they would, I mean, they would have had to deal with me. Um, but we partied, you know. And you, you look back on stuff like, I mean, we had a good time, but how good of a time really was it? You know, being this age now i mean it just it, we did some stupid things we exposed ian to a lot of things that you know we shouldn't have i mean but back in the day i mean it, 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 you nobody really thought about it you know because he was well taken care of he had everything he needed and so we just did it and didn't even think about it you know as a child i grew up not really knowing too much things around me were wrong actually i was 
completely ignorant of the things that my mom and my stepdad did in their relationship. It wasn't a perfect relationship by any means, to be honest with you. They would throw crazy parties at the house. Um, I was there like every single party. They didn't like send me to a babysitter or anything. I, got, I witnessed everything, all the partying. They would even let me have my friends over and we would be like sneaking beers and, and wine coolers behind the scenes, you know, drinking on them. I know now, you know, as I talk to my stepdad and everything that they're actually doing a lot of drugs there too. You know, that type of lifestyle that my, my mom and my stepdad were living, it never will produce a healthy relationship. You know, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes my parents would actually verbally abuse each other to the point where I'd get really, really scared. I'd run into my room, I'd put my, my hands over my ears. I would just freak me out because I never really like knew what was going on and I didn't know like how bad things could get and you know, yelling and all that around me. I just, you know, I believe that that traumatized me to an extent as a little boy. But I'm actually really blessed that I actually was never abused verbally or physically by my mom or my stepdad. Um, I always felt a lot of love from them. Love you, Dad. I love you, son. So my grandparents from my biological father's side, um, they, would, they were evangelists that traveled the world. And every now and then, every couple of years, they would come by to minister to me, wanted to take time aside to tell me about God. And they were really, truly believers. And they were always sowing seed into me and telling me about Jesus in my life. And I really think that they were praying that them seeds would grow. So at the age of 11 years old, it's hard for me to admit this, but I was molested. And at this point in my life, my innocence was just stripped from me. And I, I began to see life through a perverted lens. And, you know, back then it really just affected me so much. I started being driven by lust. Everywhere I look, everywhere I was thinking, it was just so consumed by lust. I was just so embarrassed to actually say anything to my parents about it, so I just bottled it in. I would find pornographic magazines and random fields, and I'd be looking at them, and, and then that's actually the time when I actually began to become addicted to lust. Then at that point, things started to actually really go downhill with my, my mental health. They started to put me on like all types of medications because they didn't understand what was going on in my life. They were putting me on Adderall, Ritalin, all this stuff that really they were like, man, this is going to make you uh, concentrate in school a lot. But it really didn't help me at all. It really just made me concentrate on things that I was interested in. But I was dealing with so much rejection, so much so much a darkness was inside of me because I started to feel very un misunderstood. So at this point in my life, I actually started to like a lot of demonic stuff. My favorite book was Goosebumps, and I actually listened to a lot of Rob Zombie and Corn back then. Um, my mind was so in the gutter that I actually liked to watch like internet videos of people getting hurt. My mind was like completely driven by a demonic spirit for real, for real. Uh, when I first met Ian, I was like nine years old, third grade, and everybody wanted him on the, on the soccer team. They used to fight about him being on, on their soccer team at recess because he knew how to play soccer. So they was always fighting over Ian. His uh, dad, Brian, stepdad Brian, would take us fishing on adventures in the woods and all that, and we've been friends ever since and still do the same thing to this day. Uh, we started getting in trouble real early though, I guess being, being bored. You know, we didn't have much internet back in the day. I mean, we had, we had internet, just not like it is. No, no really social media. So we was outside getting into things, getting into trouble. Man, we would go to church, but we was going to church for the wrong reason. We went to church to go get girlfriends. But I mean, it was still fun too. It still kept us out of trouble. We was there for the wrong things. Started smoking weed early. Uh, we used to smoke weed every day. We were the sneak out kings, man. We're lucky we didn't get shot by any of them girls' dads knocking on the window at night being little, little bad heathens. I never knew Ian had, had all the bad stuff going on at home that he did. 
because you know we were always gone and no that's probably the reason why we were always gone to get away from from that world we have our own little you know not fairy tale land man but like just an escape uh being out there by ourselves you know most most of the time most of the, the goofiest happiest people are the saddest and uh i think that had a lot to do with with uh, Ian's personality and his, uh, his charisma, I guess, I don't know. At this point, I was hanging out with the wrong crowd um, because I felt like they were the only ones that could, that would understand me and, and accept me for like, you know, me acting out and lashing out uh, in my life and just, you know, going down the wrong path and making bad decisions. In junior high, uh, Eight Mile came out, I remember. And that night I went home and, and I wrote my first rap. It was crazy. It was horrible, actually. <laughs> um, I was making, I started making some music with some friends and uh, I fell in love with it, actually. I was so bad at it, though, but I was determined to keep practicing and getting, and getting better. I couldn't stop even writing in class. Like, all day, I would write like three raps per day, three full pages of raps. And the teachers actually stopped even trying to teach me because they knew that, you know, I was just so determined on doing my music that I wasn't even focused on school. I was just obsessed with getting better at rapping. And I remember around 2002, I started experiment with doing coke, meth, and weed. Um, I remember the first time I did meth, I wasn't really a big fan of it, to be honest with you, because my parents already had me on Adderall, so I tried it and I was like, this, this tastes just like Adderall. And I'm not pretty, you know, pretty proud of saying that, but like I did that a couple of times and never really did nothing to me. I was more focused on like pills, coke, and all that type of stuff, and weed. Um, but I became addicted to doing drugs. I tried to mask all the feelings and emotions that I had from being molested and misunderstood. Man, ultimately, I was feeling so alone in my life. So throughout my years in school, I remember back then, I would always get in like ISS, like um, in-school suspension, and I would always be even transferred to alternative schools where all the bad kids would go. I couldn't take correction from anybody at this point. You know, I was really, really going down the wrong path. When I first met Ian, you know, we used to all just hang out together and stuff like, we all had a little circle that we was all in. It was, I guess we were the cool kids <laughs> in junior high school, right? And then, you know, we all went to SOS. I mean, well, we went to alternative school, I think that's what, that's what they called it in um, the HEB area, alternative school, SOS. And me and Ian became tight, man. And um, from there, you know, we did all type of crazy things, right? And, and Ian, you know, like I said, before they, before ASAP, he was Chigga Man. Tall, had a grill. We used to, it wasn't even, uh, it was like a silver grill we used to do. And you know, he probably remember this. We used to do like the aluminum foil grills too. But you know, he was one of the only white boys that we did hang out with, well, that I hung out with. That, you know, he was, you know, he stood out. When it came in the room, he was tall, had a grill, had the little buzz cut, you know, and you know he would jump into the freestyle flow with us, and you know the rap culture is just like it's made for black people. Let's call it what it is, you know. And Ian came in, and you know he just no matter how no matter how garbage his freestyle was. He never gave up, man, and that's, that's something to be admired, honestly, you know? And like I said, also looking back, this is a six foot white guy, and you know, coming from my culture, he was seen as one of us. So he was accepted, and I know that probably meant a lot to him, you know, at the time, being accepted, getting into all type of trouble man just going down the wrong path man going to jail <laughs> we used to do our thing sell a little bit of we wasn't doing much maybe like a freaking half ounce or something like that and 
try to bag it up. I remember we used to get these little kids and go pick out grass. <laughs> like actual grass that's growing <laughs> in the front of somebody's house and like try to crumble it up and make and, and it was so obvious like it was like straight blade grass it wasn't even like crumbly clovers or anything like that <laughs> and he'll be like hey man you ain't got no weed man you you can't ride with us now nah, man you can't ride with us and you know one thing that I always Ian was loyal man he was a loyal friend you know, one thing that I will always remember is one day, you know, we went to a party and we was driving, it was, it was like, you know, we was cars deep, you know, we was kids, everybody in their own car type stuff. I was riding with Ian and Ian did one thing that I never forgot, man. You know, there was this group of girls and this girl, he was like, hey, one of y'all girls come over here. And the girl that ended up coming over there was, you know, one of the love of my life. I ended up, yeah. Yeah, I remember that vividly, man. You know, on Ian being molested, I, I knew nothing about it. You know, it was a, it was a total shock to me. Um, I can tell at that point of his life when things started to change. Um, had I known about it at that time, I would have dealt with it. I would have not been here right now, I would have been in jail. I said, I would have hurt whoever did it. I would have killed him. I would have put him in the ground permanently. That's just how I am. You know, now that I think about it, you know, at that age, I can see where he started going downhill. But you know, with the drugs and the alcohol that me and his mom were doing, you, you know, it kind of phased it out. You really didn't think much about it. And when he finally came out and told me that, I was in shock, but because I mean, I can you can literally tell about that time that he started going downhill, that things weren't all that what it was early on. You know, we didn't really understand. It was, uh, you know, we took him to some specialists. Basically, it was put him on medications. The medications, uh, you know, you look back on that and were they working? No. Um, were they stupid medications? Of course they were. Children shouldn't be on uh, basically speed. Um, they don't need that. Um, they should be understood. He should have been understood, but he had no way to communicate because me and his mom were always, you know, not at ends, but we were too busy worrying about partying and having a good time. So about that time when he was doing all the changing, me and him fished every weekend, every weekend. It was like clockwork. Hey son, let's go fishing. Sure dad, let's get up, let's go to the bass ponds. Um, and he started fading. He'd be like, dad, I really don't want to go. I, I want to go hang out with my friends. I want to go do this and that, and we started drifting apart. So I was losing my best friend and I didn't know what to do. Um, you know, stuff started being stolen. Um, you know, it seemed like nothing I could do in my power could fix what he, I couldn't fix his problem. And I didn't know what to do about that. He would take the Christmas ornaments that we had in the yard, like the, they were the big candy canes, and somehow he would like stuff a, something in there and he'd put the pot in there. And I would find them under the shack outside. I would find them in the attic. I was finding them everywhere. Stuff started disappearing. I mean, like he was stealing it to get the drugs. Um, I mean, a lot of stuff. And you know, like I said, I mean, it was I had I was I was hopeless. There was nothing I could say or do to fix him. You know, looking back, he had he had girlfriends, a different girlfriend pretty much every week. You know, and it was to the point. You know, back then it was like I didn't care if he had sex in his room. He was my son, it was like that a boy. Uh, there was the apartments that were over by our house that he would go to. Uh, it was a bad neighborhood. Uh, a lot of bad people out there. You look back on that too, and uh, you know, he snuck out all the time. He used to sneak out and go rob people. I mean, he was just, uh, he was a hellion. He was a rebellious little kid. All because of the, I, I'm assuming it was the molestation. You know, like I said, I would have fixed it. But I mean, he just went downhill, downhill hard. So at one point, me and Ian had an argument and uh, he went to his room, I believe, and then he was in there for a little bit. And then he came out and he said, Dad, I don't feel good. And you can just tell by the look of him, he was, he was white as a ghost, he was lethargic, uh, I mean, bad. And so I had to force him to tell me what he had taken. And he had taken an overdose of Coracetin, which are cold pills, I believe. And so, you know, me and his mom were worried and we called poison control. They said, you need to rush him to the hospital because he could probably die. 
And so, I mean, I was scared. I mean, I was scared to death. And so I, I scooped him up. Uh, I threw him in the car. His mom held him, and we drove straight to the emergency room. Uh, and he was just in and out of consciousness. I mean, I was I was pretty scared. Uh, you know, over a couple hours, I guess they got him fixed where he was coherent. But you know, even that episode did not fix him. That did not. That should have scared him straight, but it did not. He continued to go back and do the stuff that he was doing. All right, man. This is. This is the Norwood house, man. It looks a lot different right now than what it used to, but I was I was raised probably from around nine years old to about 16 years old in this house, man. A lot of crazy things happened in this house. My parents throwing a lot of parties over here. You know what's crazy about it is, is me and my dad actually planted this tree right here. Um, it, it's crazy how much this thing has grown. To be honest, bro, like, a lot of dark, dark memories in this place, man. You know, I remember when I was probably from around nine years old to 12 years old, I'd wake up every single night in the middle of the night feeling like I had to walk on my bare hands throughout the house or I would die. I'd have panic attacks every single night. I'd have to wake up in the middle of the night, jump in the shower, spray water on my face. Um, there was a lot of demonic attacks in this place. I wonder if anybody's home. Let's go see if they'll let us in. Let's go see if they'll let us in the house. I'm kind of nervous right now. This is crazy. America. Let's see. Hey, what's up, man? Can I help you? Yeah, man, I, I actually used to live here a long time ago, man. Really? Yeah. Like, and I, and I was just, you know, coming by and trying to like do this documentary on my life. I'm a Christian hip hop artist and I travel the world just telling people about God and everything. And man, I, I, I we used to live here from like nine years old to like, um, to about 16 years old, man. And I just was wondering if, is it okay if I'm able to like come inside and look around and kind of like show them, show my audience the, the rooms and stuff that I used to live in and stuff like that. Is that cool? Really? Oh man, that's so cool. Let's go. Is it cool if we film? Absolutely, as long as you got a warrant. <laughs> All right, cool. Man, back in the day, there used to be like this uh, bar thing right here. Oh my gosh, this place looks crazy different. Man, wow, this used to be our living room. We used to have a corner couch right here. Um, my mom would always be sitting there. She would be drinking, watching the TV over here, smoking her cigarette. And uh, man, this was our living room. Back in the day, we used to have all the pictures on the wall right here. And then this is obviously the kitchen. They actually changed the color to it. But my mom used to always have little cows and sunflowers and stuff right here on this. So that's kind of cool. They put some stuff up there, kind of like my mom did. This is... This is crazy because this was actually the room where I started to make music. Oh, y'all got some foam up in here? Oh, that's cool. Y'all doing music in here too? Um, we used to have our computer right here and I'd have my little computer mic with some pantyhose and I'd start rapping up in here. That's crazy. Wow. That's pretty cool, man. This is actually pretty crazy because I had no no uh, carpet on the floor here. It was just all solid concrete, and I could I'd always throw my candy. Man, this is crazy. This window right here, I used to smoke so much weed and blow it out the window right here. And I also, this used to be the window I used to sneak out at night and um, and do all types of crazy stuff. We'd go out and see what kind of cars were unlocked and rob people and. Uh, go check out where the girls are. This is where my bed was right here. Um, some crazy stuff happened on that bed. Yeah, I don't want to talk about. All my weed and all my drugs was in here. This is where I would always stash my stuff. Wow, it looks so different. Thank you for letting me uh, back in this back in this home. So um, back there, they put a fence there, but there actually used to be a shed and that tree back there used to be my tree house. We'd always have the trampoline down there where we would jump on the trampoline and from the tree house 
and there was a little fort back there that my dad helped me build but it looks like they didn't even want to deal with any of that crap and they just blocked it all the way off that's wild you put some work in huh i like these couches and stuff i really appreciate you allowing this in your house is it okay if i uh, pray with you in this home absolutely man back in the day we used to have all types of parties in this place and man you know, I was, I dealt with a lot of demons in this place, you know, so I think maybe it was, it's, it's only right that I come back here and just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come in here and remove any type of spirits that may have been affecting you or the people that used to live here. So let's pray right now. You want to? Sure. Father God, I just I lift up this house to you, Lord, and I cover it in your blood, Father God. I pray against any demonic spirits that are in this place that are trying to bring fear upon my brother. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would bring peace to this place. Every single demon or evil spirit, unclean spirit under the sound of my voice be removed from this house in the name of Jesus. I pray for a cleansing prayer, Lord, that you would cleanse it from the top, from the bottom. Right now in the name of Jesus, we invite the Holy Spirit in this place. No weapon formed against the people in this house shall prosper. Lord, every single spirit that has tormented me as a child in this place must leave in the name of Jesus. And I, I thank you, Father God, for your presence to be in this place, to be able to walk around. We welcome you in this place, Father God. So have your way. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Man, thank you for allowing us to come through, bro. Of course. Man, nice to meet you, man. And uh, we'll definitely, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy to come back here, man. Man, so this was my old stomping grounds, man. This actually used to be Wesley Park, but somehow they came around and they just changed it to like copeland park or something like that but but man this is this is the, the place man this is where a lot of crazy things would happen man i'd be out here playing hooping be rolling up at this little pavilion I'd be fighting people out here i remember back in the day my ex-girlfriend uh we got i guess we broke up or whatever and she got me beat up out here sometimes you win some sometimes you lose some man but like if I was looking for trouble, I'd find it. And if I wasn't looking for trouble, it would always find me. And so it's kind of crazy how like, you know, I come out here to this to this place and it still looks the same. Like, I'm surprised this place is still standing, bruh. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of my friends that used to hang out here are not even around here no more. They're either shot or they're in jail or they're just strung out. I ran away from home to come out here to be around people that, that would accept me um because i just you know just trying to escape reality i come out here and just be blowing i was so young and uh, and doing drugs man and just getting into it, it, it like everything i could you know like this is where all my dealers would be at uh, i always go around here and just uh, just i'd be skimping people everybody around here used to know who i was everybody that i clicked with out here man they they ain't even here no more you know but I, I praise God that he got me through all this. I got a dollar, my brother. What you got? Dollar? Yeah. Okay. This one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. You seen some crazy stuff here? Boy, stuff here. In this park, uh, apartment complex? I, don't I used to I used to roam around this apartment complex a long time ago. Oh yeah? I've seen some crazy stuff out here. Have you seen any shootings or anything? No. Ah. All right, but well, thank you. Okay. You're supposed to say yes. <laughs> Bro, this is Mo's shortstop, man. When I was about like 16, 17, my partners would always be kicking it over here at these apartment complex. And uh, we used to come up here, man, and they would sell us cigarettes for like a quarter each, man. We'd always be smoking Newports coming up here, walking this back this back alley back there rolling up weed man we was just this was our this is our old stumping grounds man we did a lot of stuff around here man at this point about 2006 i was transferred to different schools because my mom and my stepdad got a divorce and i was so mad at life when this happened i, I felt like that's what you're supposed to 
be like you know when your parents get a divorce you're supposed to just be mad so i was even mad more mad at that point and i tried to hide my emotions to everyone but like there were times where i just couldn't hold it in anymore i was truly going through a lot at this point in my life i remember when asap first came to our school at haltom high school as soon as i seen him i already knew we got to get this guy this is this is this is everything we kind of inspired to be he's he's Six, three, six, four, tall T. Got a grill on the chains, the the feelers, everything we wanted to be, how we were trying to be. And uh, once we got to know him, we we realized we have a bunch of common interests. Uh, and then I find out he's a rapper. Made him even cooler. And uh, one of the house parties, one of my best memories of him was uh, he was in a rap battle, and the guy got upset ends up coming up on him, clocking him in the head with some brass knuckles, takes off running outside, ASAP goes out there. They start fighting in the yard. He beats the guy up with his head bloody. By the time I make it out there, I see Ian on top of him. We get him off, we go back in. He picks the microphone back up and just continues what he was doing like nothing ever happened. That's just what kind of guy he was. We had a lot of good times, but we had a lot of dark times too. And uh, you could always tell that ASAP was going through a lot, um, a lot of stuff he really didn't speak of, but you could tell he was, he had a lot going on. You know, I remember back then, I was so wild that some of my friends and I would leave in the middle of class just to go into the parking lot of, of uh, Haltom High School and just do some coke and then go right back into class. Look, I, re I was even like trying to fight teachers back then. If it didn't go my way, I would spaz out and get violent. I remember like starting problems with the principal. Like I remember I almost got in a fight with the principal at Haltom High School. And uh, the cops were there and I was trying to like post them up outside where everybody goes in through the front doors. I ended up walking home all depressed. Man, I was, I was really going through a lot. So I eventually just dropped out of high school and I felt like there was no point in going at this point. I was dealing with a lot of suicidal thoughts and depression. I was losing friends around me. Some of my friends would get shot and killed and that would even make me more depressed. It was getting so bad. I started to ride around with even gangs and we was doing things that I can't actually even talk about on camera. I started to move actually really, really sloppy and I ended up catching my first case. And when I tell you that when I went to jail, I went to jail over and over. And uh, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun going to jail whatsoever. So back in 2009, I remember, I was hitting the streets and doing it all. Almost every single day and every single night, I was bar hopping, hitting up parties, going to strip clubs, dance clubs, um, like Club Chrome in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I think a lot of people might know <laughs> that place. I was always up there. Um, I actually became a club promoter um, because I actually, they were, if I was a club promoter and I got people in the club for free, I'd actually um, get the drink for free. But back then I used to go by Chigamane. <laughs> I actually still got it tatted right here. Um, but back then, uh, I used to go by Chigaman. Actually, was pretty, pretty well known in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, I remember back then, I really couldn't keep a job nowhere. See, I could get a job, but I couldn't stay there. <laughs> I think uh, literally, like I had about like 50 jobs. I resorted to actually robbing people and even stealing from the people closest to me. Um, I started to sell drugs. Like I was really starting to sell drugs at this point. I sold weed back in the day in like junior high and everything, but I really started to sell like pounds and stuff at this point. I remember getting kick doed, pistol whipped, and they put me in the shower at gunpoint by some people while they ransacked my house for all my valuable stuff and drugs. So I would spend all my money on drugs <laughs> from the money that I would sell drugs with uh, to the point where, man, I, w I couldn't even be responsible enough to get my own place to live. I was even staying from hotel to hotel for over about a year. And I'm talking about these hotels 
were so nasty. There was cockroaches. I could get the cheapest hotel for like $29 a night. But, it, it, you know, I got to do my own thing. I got to, you know, fulfill my own pleasures and all that stuff in that place. So it felt like, you know, I was, it felt like I was winning living in one of those type of hotels, to be honest with you. So I remember at this point, I was having an off and on relationship with this pastor's daughter. And I'm telling you, you would think that that's a good relationship. Nope. That thing was the most toxic relationship I ever had in my whole life. Um, I didn't really know too much about God at this point. Obviously, you know, my grandparents would tell me, you know, um, about God and everything every now and then. Um, but, you know, these people at this church, uh, the mercy seat, showed me so much love and care. I never felt a genuine love from a group of people like this on that level, actually. Most of my friends had their own things going on, but these people made time for me and began to sow seed into me. I remember this. We would always be breaking up all the time. And I would find whoever could let me stay at their house. I would even, I would even sleep on the floor of these people's houses. And I'm telling you like, yeah, some friends would let me stay at their place and everything like that. But sometimes it would just be random people. Um, I was sleeping on an apartment floor of this lady's crib that couldn't, she couldn't even get up out of bed. And, but she had a whole bunch of drugs and narcotics that she would give me for free. So I would just be strung out all the time and I would just stay there and just sleep on her floor. During this time when I was homeless and sleeping on this lady's floor, I actually had a job right across the street. And man, I would go to this job and I would actually just I would I would find my way, my loophole on being able to steal from this job. And I didn't stay there for long. I think I was only there for like a month and a half. But during that month, because I was there all the time, and I'm sure the bosses were like, man, he really wants to work. Um, I got employee of the month. And so the same month I got employee of the month, they found out I was stealing. They called me on the phone while I was strung out on my day off. And they said, hey, we found out you're stealing. We're going to have to let you go. If you don't bring your outfit up here um, and return your, your fit, then we're going to take it out of your paycheck. And I was like, you know, I already I had nothing. I had nothing else to lose. So I'm like, bro, you're going to make me come up there and see you and bring my clothing um, or you're going to take money out of my check. I bet. And so when I went up there back then, I'm I, I'm grilled out. I got chains. I got a uh tall t um and my i didn't have like a strap or anything at this time but i had like a crocodile dundee knife so i walked right into the job with this huge knife popping out the back of my shirt i remember i went in there and i had all types of intentions to hurt these people i threw the clothes at the boss so i told him come outside we about to get it in uh the cops were called and when i went out to the front the cops were like they put me in handcuffs and let me tell you i was at my lowest point in my life um that I looked at the police and I said, I don't even want to live no more, shoot me in the head. I remember they locked me up. I remember going into that jail cell and I didn't have no friends showing up or anything to come see me, but there was this Bible that was just sitting there. And I remember the, you know, all, all the things from church at this point, you know, I needed to call upon God. I, let, me, let me just try him out and see if he actually like listens to me. So I opened up this Bible and when I opened up this Bible, the words just start speaking to me like if it was somebody else in this room. And I felt something, I felt this peace come over me. And I had this peace inside of a place that people don't have peace in. And I looked up to God and I said this, Lord, if you get me out of this mess, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. I knew at this point that like, I wasn't gonna wait for God to move. I wanted to show God that I was willing to work on my behalf and keep my promise that I would serve him forever. It was amazing. I felt the Holy Spirit in this place. And I believe that that was the first time I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And it was the best day of my life. When I was in jail, I realized I was done with the life that I was living. I realized I was chasing all these things that were wasting my time and it was leaving me empty inside. I realized I can't do this on my own anymore. And I actually never could. So when I got out, I saw the world completely different. I saw the world as a dying world. 
and I saw the world just needing this peace that I just received. So all I knew about Jesus growing up uh, from my grandparents and from my mom, they would tell me, yeah, Jesus died on the cross, but I didn't know you could actually receive the Holy Spirit and have a relationship with him. I thought it was just a story and you know, you believe that and you go to heaven type of thing, but you didn't get to get, have a relationship. I didn't know of anything about a relationship or like having a relationship with a living God. It was the first time in my whole life that I felt complete peace and love. There was nothing like it, but God saw me right where I was. He saw me with a blunt in my hand. He saw me at the club. He saw me having one night stands. He saw me hanging around gangs and he said, I still want him. This love was incredible to me. I felt the Holy Spirit and it changed me in my core to follow God in my life. I didn't know what that looked like, but I wanted to try. I didn't really know how to walk in Christ at this point, but I would hear God's voice over time just telling me not to do things and to do things um, and learning from my mistakes. But at this point, I didn't know how to transition from the streets because that was all I knew. Walking this Christian walk wasn't easy. Actually, let me rephrase that. This Christian walk is not hard. It's having one foot in the world and one foot with God that makes it hard, actually. Because you don't reap the benefit of either when you're lukewarm. You don't get the benefit of the world because conviction kills you. You don't get the benefit of being a Christian because you're still living in the world. I was struggling with the choice of going all in for God, letting everything go or follow my selfish desires. And that's what it really boiled down to in my life at that point. It's kind of embarrassing to talk about, you know, me continuing to slip up after knowing God, but I feel like it's, it's necessary to be said because somebody might be out there feeling that same way and feel like there's no hope for them. I was still a little hot-headed, short-tempered. Um, I couldn't accept correction, and I still didn't know how to let some addictions go, or I still wasn't willing to let some addictions go, to be honest with you. Um, but I remember I would still be going in and out of jail even after this point a couple more times. Um, I ended up going back to jail for an assault, and um, the last time I actually went to jail, I met a really good friend in there. Um, brother Daniel <laughs> when I when I met him this dude comes in the jail cell like 20 people he's on fire for God and I was praying to God man I was praying to God I was like Lord send somebody in here that I could relate to the jail cell opened up and he came in with the fire of the Holy Spirit and he just started immediately ministering to people like within like two footsteps of him walking in that jail cell. He turned to the first person and started ministering to him. I remember when I, I met Preach, uh, it was crazy. I had got locked up that year. I was already um, in ministry and um, I didn't understand why I went to jail. But I know that when I got in there, I was already on fire for the Lord. And I remember that the first thing I did was would start trying to minister to, to somebody. And uh, I mean, the Holy Spirit was just moving. But there was this one tall guy, he's ridiculous tall, man, dude. But he was just staring and he was trying to, he came up to me and talking, trying to talk to me. And um, the next thing you know, I kind of like just didn't mean to, but I was in the spirit, so I dismissed him. And, uh, but I seen like the look in his face. So after I dismissed him and started talking to this other man, uh, I looked back at him and the first thing he said was like, brother. <laughs> and he gave me this amazing hug. And I didn't know that he had already been praying, you know, for someone to come in. And uh, the look in his eyes, the hunger, the, 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 the thirst uh, for the Lord and to see so saved was just, Awesome. I, I knew that, that he was just needing a, a, a someone else just to get his back with him as far as uh, Christ goes. So that night we started just conversating and I was getting to know him. But just the passion inside of him, the, the happiness uh, for the brethren was what amazed me. So we just sat there and talked all night. I got to know him and we've been brothers ever since. And it's been a blessing. So when I got out of jail, uh, he started uh, he started to come around 
He was so hungry, so excited about the ministry. Actually, from that point, it was kind of, we were kind of inseparable. I mean, he was do, doing things that I was asking. He was so excited about the ministry. He had ended up putting uh, tongues of fire on the back uh, of his vehicle. I didn't even know that was being done. It's the first time I guess anybody ever put anything on the back of their vehicle when it came to the ministry. I noticed that he was more hungry than everyone else when it came to the music. I mean, he had a serious passion for it. I mean, he was a little bit cocky, but he was good. He was just for sure of himself. Um, I knew from then on that, that that's what that's what he was going to do. I mean, uh, he, he, he had other giftings, but that one was sig signaled out, I mean. But uh, it was, he was, his hunger and thirst for the Lord and, and, and the passion to do the music was, was different. He was just different from everybody else. His verses were longer than everybody else's. Uh, his part was better than everybody else's. I mean, but it, it, it was okay. I just knew who, who he was and, and why he was the way he was. Uh, because he had the talent, uh, he had the voice, uh, but inside he was still growing, but he was willing to grow. He was willing to learn. He, uh, like I said, he didn't just have that hunger for music. He had that, that hunger for the Lord. He wanted to go further in the Lord. Uh, and before he can advance in his music, he would have to grow uh, in Christ. And uh, that he did. That he did. So around this time, um, about a year after going to Brother Daniel's and fellowshipping with the brothers, I was on Facebook and I was just scrolling through the feed and something caught my eye and uh, I re reconnected with an old friend and we started dating. So I first met my husband in high school and um, he was cute. I was like, he's, you know, this tall white boy. We never really did anything though, like, we never really were like boyfriend and girlfriend, but he was always like writing me notes, passing me notes during like class. Um, his class was like connected to my portable, so he was always sending me notes and stuff when we were, you know, passing each other up. Um, I remember he um, used to come over to my house and hang out sometimes with his friend Brett, and um, he told me one day that he was ending up moving to Hawaii. I was kind of sad because um, I was getting to know him and everything and I was like, I kind of had a little crush on him. So I was like, dang, he's, you know, he's moving away. And uh, I was bummed. I was kind of bummed out because I didn't really, you know, get to have like a relationship with him. But he ended up moving back uh, to Texas from Hawaii and he hit me up on Facebook and um, I was like, oh, okay, you know, he was looking good and everything. And I was like, so I hit him back and he was like, how about you come out to Tyler and hang out with me and stuff and I did I stayed the weekend with him and then from there we kind of like we're building a relationship and stuff and we've been together ever since. One thing I do remember um, was that when we first started talking um, I was going through a lot I have been through a lot in my life and I was kind of going through like a rough patch and he was still living in Tyler and he would come back and forth to kind of visit me and stuff. And so we were just kind of communicating through like Facebook and on the phone and everything. And I was kind of going through a rough time. I had ended up wanting to commit suicide at one point and I was fully committed to doing that. I had my mom's medication that I had found in her bathroom and I grabbed a bunch of it and I remember grabbing a knife and I, either way I was going to, you know, commit suicide. If it wasn't the pills that were going to take me, I was going to slit my wrist and that was going to be something that I was going to do and fully commit to it. And uh, I was sitting in my closet and I had locked it because I remember they, whoever made the, the door had a, like a lock from the inside and so I had locked the the closet door and I was just sitting there and I was just you know thinking about all the things that had happened in my life but in that moment when I was in my closet I said you know God if you're real please show me and reveal yourself to me because I'm afraid right now I don't want to do this but I'm so hurt and I'm so tired of going through what I'm you know I've been going through I just need you to show up for me and not 
even seconds after that, Ian called me and he was telling me that, you know, I don't know why, but the Holy Spirit wanted me to call you and just, you know, we kind of had a, a little bit of an argument a couple of days before, so we weren't talking. So he ended up, uh, you know, apologizing for the things that he said to me and the Holy Spirit started speaking through him and I ended up getting saved. We, we talked for probably like four hours on the phone and by the end of the conversation, I was giving my life to God and I'm, I'm very thankful for that conversation. You know, at this point in my life, I'm still dealing with a lot of things that I've experienced as a child, being completely misled by, you know, the traumatic experiences that I dealt with. I ended up falling back into smoking weed and popping pills again. So on Halloween night of 2012, I was set up by one of my friends on a drug deal gone wrong. I was getting, I was getting it for some dudes. I didn't even know who they were actually. It was for this girl. She was gonna hook me up with an ounce out of me just getting them like a pound of weed or whatever. But as soon as I got in this car, and I'm telling you, I felt in my spirit to turn around and go back home, but I didn't. Once we get to the trap house, this girl comes out, takes dude's money, and we sat in the car for about an hour just waiting for them to bring out the product, but she never did. At this point, they told me to hop in the back seat, and I got in the back seat between both of them, and one had a knife on this side and one had a gun on this side. And then they're like, you know, we ain't gonna wait here no more. Let's go. Let's go, let's go take his body and go do something with it. They're gonna get rid of my body and kill me. But under my breath, while we were driving, I said, Jesus, save me. And I remember one of those dudes looking straight at me and he was like, Jesus ain't gonna save you. And then they pull over, they pull over to transfer me into a different car because the girl that I was trying to help out, she was scared and she didn't want no part of what was about to happen. But when they were transferring me to another car and they had that knife and, and the gun next to me, I heard God say, don't fight, just run. And so I did. And they were trying to stab me and beat me to a bloody pulp, ripping off all of my clothes. Literally when they were done beating me up, I was in nothing but boxers with blood all over my face. I had to find a way home with no shoes, no clothes and completely beaten up. But God saved me and he allowed me to see another day. It was moments like that that showed me that he was real and that he had my back. There were many times in my life, whether it be an overdose, driving drunk, completely wasted like at 3 a.m. and God would drive me home. I had no idea how I got home with no accidents. And you know, every single time I call upon the Lord, he would save my life. You know, one thing in my life that I always struggled with was there were two things I struggled with and that was smoking weed and watching porn. I was doing Christian rap as a hobby at this point, but at this point I really started to follow God. You know, after all these traumatic experiences, even after knowing God, I was like, you know what? I feel like God is just telling me I need to stop doing certain things. So I started to let some things go. I learned a lot about myself. I started to realize what the sin was doing to me what it was doing to my relationship with God and my marriage and the relationships with my friends. And it broke me down. And I just had to get to the point where I hated sin because I realized that if I loved it, I was gonna run back to it. But if I hate it, I'm gonna leave it alone. Yeah, you know, I wasn't really wanting, I really wasn't doing full-time music at this point because, you know, obviously I had to try to keep a job and I really couldn't keep a job nowhere. But when I was doing music, Christian music, it was so therapeutic to me. And I wanted to start to use this gift that God gave me to tell people about Him. And I started to spend a lot of time doing it. I remember I, I started to flood the scene of Dallas-Fort Worth. I was trying to reach out to a whole bunch of Christian artists and link up with them. I was getting plugged into the CHH community out here in Dallas-Fort Worth. And man, I met a lot of good friends along the way. So when I first met ASAP Preach, it had to have been like 10 years ago. We did a cypher together. I was actually a part of his cypher. Um, I met with a producer that we were trying to mu do some music together. And he told me about this guy who was putting together a cypher. Preach didn't know who I was and he just trusted the guy. 
show up, white dude, completely tatted up. I'm like, man, who is this? Turned out Buddy could actually rap for real. Like he really was serious about his craft. Even though he had just been getting started, he was really serious. So we hit it off and we just really just start kicking it regularly. Then we start hitting shows together. I'm talking about three, four shows a week. We were going to open mics. We was going to club appearances. If your church would let us come, we coming. We would be dripped out. We had our camo shorts on. We was lit. And to see where God has taken him from those humble beginnings to where he is now is amazing. We literally can be out somewhere and people will recognize him. And it's not no recognized on no starstruck stuff. It's recognized like, bro, you changed my life. Bro, I was listening to your project while I was in prison. Bro, I, you helped me get through this tough time. Like that kind of stuff right there blows my mind. To see somebody that I met 10 years ago be transformed in many different ways to be the kind of person he is today. So I'm honored to know them. So still not being able to keep a job to provide for my wife and my, my little girl, Sadie, um, I actually started tattooing. Um, I felt like, you know, I was always good at drawing and stuff, so I kind of wanted to, you know, do tattoos. I liked doing tattoos at the time. I didn't have no conviction on getting tattoos, so I was like, you know what, I'll do tattoos. I'll be a Christian tattoo. I'll only do script. I'll only do lettering. You know, I started to do a lot of tattoos, and I actually got really good at it, believe it or not. I never really liked the environment of like, you know, getting people's blood on me and, you know, dealing with that type of lifestyle because it wasn't consistent money all the time. But while I was a tattoo artist, I kept on hearing the voice of God telling me my identity wasn't found in that, you know, cause I was making music that was so powerful. You know, I, I was ministering to people, you know, a couple of my friends would hear my music cry and stuff like that. So I knew that I had a calling in my music. Um, and then that voice would always just say, are you willing to let it go? And it was just a gentle voice. It wasn't like, let it go. It was, it was, it was God saying, are you willing to let this go? After years of denying that, and while I was thinking like, how am I gonna provide if I don't tattoo or do this? I mean, cause I couldn't keep a job and doing anything else. I just brush off the voice for years. Till one day I was in a tattoo shop sitting in the tattoo chair, no, no clients or anything. And he asked me one more time. And he said, if you do things that glorify me, I'll provide for your family forever. And I said, Lord, if this is you, take this desire away from me, the tattoo. And I'm telling you, not even 15 minutes go by, somebody comes in wanting to get the very same type of tattoos I love doing, lettering. And I went back to the back and I started to draw it up. And while I was drawing it up, I realized I had no desire to tattoo anymore. And I looked back at all the tattoo artists. I was like, y'all want to buy my stuff? I'm willing to sell all this. And so my wife, it's like 11 o'clock at night. I drive home and I knock on the door because she, you know, she had the door lock or whatever. And she opens up the door and I just start crying because I felt like, you know, I was dealing with something that was trying to steal my identity for so long. And I didn't know how I was going to provide for them anymore, but I just knew I needed to trust God. It was a leap of faith. I remember one night there was a knock on the door and my husband was supposed to be at work and um, I opened the door and it was him. And he's just standing there in the doorway and he's just crying. He's just crying. He doesn't even say anything. And I asked him what happened. You know, I'm thinking in my mind, like he got fired from his job. You know, they let him go. You know, he had a miscommunication with his boss or something. And he ends up telling me um, that he just was convicted um, at his work. He was doing tattoos and it was something that the Holy Spirit had put on his heart to stop doing. And I remember him telling me that he had no desire to do this anymore, but the Lord had told him if he did something that, you know, glorified him, he would, you know, provide for our family and take care of our family, you know, and he would bless him through his obedience. And I was, I was worried, I was afraid, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I was eight months pregnant with our son and I was like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to get a full-time job. And I was like, you know, I don't know how we're gonna do this, but I had faith that God was gonna work this out and he was gonna see this through and, and he did. But from that day forth, I picked up a camera my wife actually bought me a camera and I started to make music videos. 
I spent a lot of time producing my first studio album and it was ASAP, which stands for Always Say a Prayer. And that album did really good. It allowed me to actually see the fruits of my labor. And it showed that God was keeping his promise that he was providing because I was starting to get some paychecks through it. And I wasn't doing it for the money, but you know, I didn't know I was going to get any money doing this. I just wanted to follow God. And it started to provide for my family. And I just continued to put out more and more music at this point for over um, six or seven years. And I just wanted to stay faithful to him in that. And he was being faithful to me by keeping his promise. And everything was going so good until 2019 when COVID hit. And when COVID hit, it hit hard. My grandfather was one of the most consistent men in my life, other than my stepdad. Because ultimately, you know, my mom and my, my stepdad got a divorce, so he kind of went his separate way. But my grandfather never left my side. He got me my first car. He supported me. Every, he got me my, actually my first silver chain. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of really good memories from my grandfather. He would pick me up from elementary school, take me to Red Lobster or Chick-fil-A, and get me whatever I wanted. And I would just sit there. He would bring me my little tray. I was probably like nine. I was just a little kid, just really little. And he'd bring a little tray and bring me my little drink. And after I'd eat, he would always just bring me out some ice cream. And man, I loved him so much. And he really had to deal with a lot of the bad side of me through my teenage years too. You know, with the type of love that he showed me, he never gave up on me. And then three days later, Hi baby, this is your mom just calling to check on you. Call me when you get a chance. I love you. Bye. Angela was the other half of my soul as a friend. Um, the day that we met officially in Austin, we connected. I mean, we finished each other's sentences. We knew what each other were, were saying, were going to say. I mean, and Robert, who was with us, was just, he was blown away. He's like, how are y'all doing that? And we just did. We connected within the, within the first five minutes and we were best friends. Uh, mind you, I was in Austin and she went back up to uh, the HB area. But, and there was no cell phones back then, but somehow, and I really don't know how, but I guess when I moved back up to uh, the HB area, we connected and, we just started hanging out. We were in our early 20s at that point. Angela was the type of person that when she walked into a room, she lit it up. And I don't care what kind of mood you were in, how you were feeling, she knew how to connect with people. And you may have been four foot tall, but when she was done with you, uh, she made you feel 10 feet tall. She just had a knack for telling people what they needed to hear when they needed to hear it in the most loving, fun mannered way. It was, she was very emotional, but she laughed a lot and that's how she got by with 
not crying as much as she should have. We both cried together, but uh, we, we laugh more than anything. I mean, we would just look at each other and laugh. She didn't have a mean bone in her body. Um, that's the whole, because of her outside beauty, I think in her bubbly personality, a lot of people misconstrued her before they met her. They just pretty much, she's a little, you know, she's, she's beautiful and she's blonde and blah, blah, blah. But no, that, that was, that, yeah, that was part of her, but that wasn't Angela. Angela, like I said, once you knew her, you instantly loved her. I mean, you just wanted to be close to her. I mean, that was just her presence. She drew people into her. So you got past the beauty and you saw the beauty from the inside. And then, like I said, no matter who she was around, they were laughing and they were just laughing at her best friend uh, when, they left, when they left her. See, my mom, she was like, she was the sweetest woman I've ever met in my whole life. And she would, she would never let me go without, to be honest. And you know, when I was homeless and living on these streets, I could have asked her for anything and she would have gave it to me. But I didn't want to do that because I wanted to feel like a grown man. But she would never let me go without. And she was my rock. You know, my parents would get in fights. She would go in the room and try to comfort me. Many times she came in clutch in my life. She loved my children so much. Everybody loved her. I, she, she used to always show me her yearbook. She was the um, class favorite in, at Hearst Junior High. And we weren't always on the best terms because of me trying to be a Christian and protect my children because she just wanted to spoil them all the time. But man, she was such a good woman. I couldn't believe it. I was in shock when I found out she passed away. And I got the call, your mom's not breathing no more. My mom, she would get me through everything as a child. You know, even though she misunderstood me, like she loved me. She was always wanting to know what's wrong and she taught me a lot of valuable lessons, like being grateful for life. You know, I was her only child. When she passed away, I had her blocked on my phone, on all my social medias, over something so petty. And I never got to say goodbye. At this point in my life, I went through a really rough stage of depression. It was taking a toll on me. I literally lost two of the closest people in my life three days apart. The comments are right. I'll never amount to nothing. I'm a horrible husband, son, and father. I'm not a real Christian. I don't read the word like I should. I should have been there for my mom. I've made too many mistakes. Nobody likes my music. What am I even doing this for? Should I quit making music? Should I give up on life? When Ian lost his mom and his grandpa, it was, it was a really dark time for us. It was really heavy on our family. I remember there were times where he would just stay in his studio and just work on music and he barely, 
he barely talked to us. Um, we barely saw him. He would sleep in and he would be up all night in his studio and he would just put that pain towards doing music. Um, and just, I remember losing my dad and you know, there's so many different ways to cope with losing somebody. So I never really, you know, nagged him about it or, you know, fought with him about how he coped with losing his mom and his grandpa. So he was, he was in there a lot. And this music that he was putting out was so powerful. You could hear the pain behind it. Um, and you could, he was just being real transparent with what he was going through. He was um, being pressed, he was being crushed, and it produced a lot of anointing in his music, and it was just on a whole nother level. See, I didn't mean to push people away at this moment, like my wife or my kids or my friends, but I just found that being in the studio was a safe place for me. I found it so therapeutic. I would literally be in the studio and break down in tears, and God would meet me there. And the music that he was putting on my heart, it was so powerful because I really wasn't doing it for anybody else. I was doing it for me. This new passion for music was anointed. And I believe it was anointed because of the pressing of everything going on in my life. And it was like fine oil on my music. You could hear it. You could hear my cry in my songs. And I started to work on this, this album called Heaven Bound, which I dedicated that album to my mom, my grandfather. And that's still my favorite album to this day. When I first came across ASAP Music, I was probably in one of the darkest places of my life. Just trying to find who I was, my identity. And his music was so transparent, like it helped me become a better person. It helped me follow Christ. It helped me actually want to dig more and read more into Christ's life. The perfect song for me was Fight For You because I was so suicidal. I was going through a lot and that song just resonated. It, it hit me core, like deep in my core to keep pushing. I know some people who go through a lot of dark times and you don't think there's no light at the end. That song gave me that light. That song helped me to keep pushing each day. I had that song on repeat so many times just so I can just wake up and, and just keep fighting. Like I had kids to fight for. I, I just wanted to just live for them and live through them and keep and show them God's light. I am so grateful for ASAP's music. What's so amazing about ASAP Preachers Ministry is that these events is not just about the music. It's about inviting the Holy Spirit to come in and create an altar that's there for the broken, the lost, and the people that need hope. And the Lord is able to use ASAP Preach to be able to minister to these folks and to be able to allow them to have their lives changed from the heart, from the inside out. You would think that it's only the younger generation that's coming out to these events and to hear the music, but it's touching all walks of life, all generations, from the young all the way up into the elderly. And we're just so grateful that we're able to be used in this ministry for the glory of God. Since the Lord Jesus Christ has changed ASAP's heart, His ministry has been able to reach millions of people with over 60 million streams reaching the entire world, from China to Brazil, from the United States to Canada, and all over the world. The Lord has even been able to use ASAP's music in my life. When I was dealing with cancer, a lot of times I wasn't even able to open my word and read God's word, but God was able to minister to me through ASAP's music. All those times I was going through chemo and they just putting in the music in my ear was very ministering to me. And I'm so thankful that the Lord used that to be able to touch my heart and help me get through the most difficult time of my life. When I first listened to ASAP preach, I was uh, sitting in a dozer and his music came on and I played it all day and I played it all the next day. The song I got to the first time was Tested and I was in a place in my life where I was trying to uh, make business decisions instead of ministry decisions. But what I learned as an old bald fat guy, white guy, was that ASAP's music can reach anybody and it has that opportunity to fill in the gap that churches miss. There was a song he had called Letters to God and as I listened to that song, I had to stop the machine and I had to play it again and I had to stop the machine and play it again. And then I had to pray that song was talking about 
He was asking God to show him how to see people the way that God sees people and have a heart for the lost people and the broken people. And it changed the way that I was able to walk through serving God. I took that opportunity and that song to heart and started putting on Christian rap concerts. Um, not the guy that they would expect to be calling to do it. Um, not the person that ever listened to rap music. But through ASAP's music, it allowed us to step out of our comfort zone and begin to serve in a different way, in a different capacity. And it helped change my heart and soften my heart to see the broken as people that need to be loved on just as much as the healthy. And it was after some reflection on seeing how his music can impact the lost people that I realized really where he was going with it all was in Luke 5. He was saying that, man, healthy people don't need a doctor. Um, sick people do. And he was helping me see how to chase down those sick people and love on them. So it's been a couple of years for me now and I'm still trying to heal from that experience. But it put a fire inside me to go even harder. I just wanted to go harder for my mom. I wanted to go harder for God because one day I knew I wanted to meet her again. And I knew that she was looking down on me and I wanted to make her proud. I was able to vent everything that I was going through, whether it be anxiety or depression. I was able to express everything that I was going through in my music. And even thousands upon thousands of people were messaging me, telling me how they received hope through my music. It was changing their lives. I love that I was able to impact people through a problem that I was going through myself. After everything that I've been through in my life, unfortunately, I couldn't learn from the mistakes of others. I always had to go through them myself to learn from my mistakes. But when you fall, you get back up. And one thing about laying my life down for the King is that there's no other feeling than knowing that you're right in God's eyes. Knowing that you have nothing to hide from anyone. The peace that comes from knowing that you're right in God's eyes it's unmatchable. It's nothing like it. Going through all the bad things that I went through, it could either break somebody or make somebody. And I refuse to let it break me. See, I learned to enjoy the process of pain in rough times because of what it produces when you're going through the fire. It produces character. And most importantly, it produces a genuine trust in God. Now I'm traveling the world telling people about this hope that I have in Jesus. That there is hope in the addiction, hope in trauma, hope in the painful times, hope in knowing that things can get better and change. Most importantly, the forgiveness that he gives. I even had to learn how to forgive myself from the mistakes that I made from growing up and even after knowing God. I always tell people if God can forgive me and show mercy to me after all that I've done after knowing him, he can still save you. He can still show mercy on you and grace. And he can do that for them. I no longer have to carry this burden on my heart no more. I'm forgiven. God took it from me and he healed me and still healing me to this day. I came to realize that a lot of things that I used to go through and the things that I've gone through in my life, I would be ashamed of it and not really talk about it, right? These problems and tribulations are not all about me because now I've realized that God wanted me to go through certain things. Why? Because there's somebody out there going through the same thing that needs to hear the hope that I have in Christ. See, everything that we go through in life, whether it be good things or bad things, all things work together for the good of those who love God and called according to his purpose. One thing that God is doing in my life is that I don't want to be the law to nobody. When we look back in the scriptures, we see Jesus, he met people where they are and he loved them. He is rich in mercy and grace. See, when I pass away, I don't want people to look at me as somebody that pushed them further away from God, but someone who showed grace and mercy and met them where they are. I had to reestablish this back in my heart because to win people over, it's not to be harsh, it's to be gentle like Christ is and to show them God's goodness in you because it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. See, here's the thing, is that Jesus Christ, he's alive. And he saw somebody that was counted out by everybody 
somebody that was lost, somebody that was broken, and he turned my life around and changed me from the inside. His death and resurrection gave me life and gave me hope that I would be able to see him for eternity and experience his love forever. I don't choose to follow Jesus because I'm scared of him anymore. I choose to follow him because of how much he loved me first. It's just so wild. I was dead and I could do nothing on my own strength, but now, but now I'm alive in Christ. So if you watch this documentary and you're just feeling in your heart, man, it touched me. It touched me deep down in my core and I am not where I'm supposed to be in Christ. And I just wanna give you an opportunity to accept Jesus into your heart. If you're feeling like, man, I just wanna find this love and this peace that you received ASAP. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to pray, but I wanna accept God into my heart and I wanna try Jesus out. I just want you to close your eyes right there, wherever you're watching this and just say, Jesus, I believe you died and rose again. And I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. But I'm asking you today, forgive me. Holy Spirit, come live inside of me. I can't do this on my own anymore. I choose to follow you Give me ears to hear your voice more clearly and eyes to see your ways. And I thank you for your gift of salvation. In Jesus name, God bless. We are so excited that you made it to the end of this documentary. If you feel like you're being led to partner with ASAP Preach, we'd love for you to go to asappreachmusic.com and we'd love to lock arms with you. In Jesus name.